Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzle loading, and this is a 1678 dated Baltic snap lock rifle. The swamped octagon barrel has eight groove rifling, blade and notch sights, and a short bent tang. The distinctive lock has a pivoting pan cover, MRK signed at the center, floral engraving, and external cock sear in 1678 engraved ahead of a lion mask at the tail. The furniture is mainly sheet iron aside from the heavier sweeping trigger guard. The side plate is in the shape of a lion and the cheek has MRK in raised relief carving and a TN254 inventory marking on the left side of the butt. And the barrel walls are very heavy. For being a 42 caliber rifle, the barrel walls are about a quarter of an inch thick. So we have about a half inch of barrel all the way around here, making this for a very front heavy rifle. And when we look at this rifle, there's a lot of stylistic differences compared to some of the other European muzzleloaders that we see. Mainly when you look at this, you're gonna notice the very short buttstock area. Um, when attempting to shoulder this rifle here, I'll show you, there's not really a whole lot um, of, of positions for you to go. So my hand is kind of your average sized American adult here, grips rather comfortably in the trigger guard, but my hand pretty much covers up the entirety of the buttstock. So uh, more research for me is definitely needed, but I don't think that this is necessarily meant to be fired from the shoulder. Um, we have a front and rear sight here. So we can bring this rifle up to about here, but as I turn here, my cheek and my face is the only thing really sh holding this rifle. I don't have any shoulder support when, um, when holding this up. I think that just comes to be you know, a stylistic difference for us. Uh, maybe this is just a really long barreled pistol and I'm just kind of a sissy, I don't know. <laughs> Apart from some of that mystery and some of that intrigue, I'm sure uh, some of my European firearms historians would know quite a bit more. Uh, I'm excited to dive into these a little bit more because they are fairly foreign to me. Um, we have a really interesting kind of triangular buttstock here with some beautiful shaped carving on here just to get the silhouette of this. So much like we'd see on many other European styled rifles, we have uh, a rather flat toe here at the bottom. We have that same shape reflected up here at the top. So atop the crest of our buttstock here, it's nice and flat, really distinctive shape. And we have some nice lines coming up to the tang. From there, it kind of shelves off at an angle before we get back to where our patch box is. And we have a beautiful swoop carved into this buttstock. On the side face of our buttstock, we have a sliding wood patch box. What's neat about this is it has a little bit of travel to expose the release for this box. So as it sits here, I, there's no release. I can't activate this. Um, and I think that's really smart. There's no way to, to really lose this as you're traveling as long as it's caught in there. There's nothing can activate that release. To access the release, we push this back about an eighth of an inch and exposes the tail end of our patch box release spring. And there we can activate and get access to our patch box and release our lid. Beautifully simple spring on here. Uh, it's held in, I believe, just by a right angle being driven into the patch box wood here. And we can see a beautifully filed catch here. I just want to make note of that. Just a beautiful little detail there. Just this gentle swoop coming up a hard line to where it stops. We have kind of a trapezoidal patch box here. Again, naked wood on the inside, unfinished wood here. Rather deep coming in here, you know, very handy little compartment uh, to carry some of the items that you might need. The butt face of our patch box lid here is plain wood. We have some simple carving here, several wedding band style lines and a slightly concaved band in between them. At the front, we have an applied metal tip here with a gentle spike going back to the center of the patch box. Moving down to the trigger guard on the underside of the buttstock here, we have a beautifully shaped iron trigger guard. What's neat about this is we have kind of the inverse of several later European rifles, where traditionally the head of the tang bolt would start at the tang and go through and connect into the trigger plate or the trigger guard. Here we have the reverse. The head of our tang bolt is connected down here to our trigger guard and it passes through the stock and is then threaded into our barrel tang here on the top. 
At the top here, we have an exposed bolt section here. It's interesting to see this left this long. It does not interfere with the sight picture, but I just want to make note of that. The other end of our trigger guard is really neat, uh, I think, because on several of these early style muzzle loaders like this one, we don't have a lot of hardware being utilized. We just have the shape of metal and physics being used here. So the tail end of our trigger guard is forged or filed into a point. It is then forced through the stock, either through a hole or tapped through, and up into our patch box. In the patch box then, the excess material is bent over at a 90 degree to tighten up the trigger guard to the bottom of the stock and securely fasten the trigger guard to the stock. So inside of our trigger guard here, we can see a small section of the tail of our trigger guard bent over to secure it to the stock. Really like those details, those simple applications to configure this hardware. Coming forward, we have a large lock set up here. Being so early, I think it makes sense that we have a rather large lock assembly here. And much of the lock internals are secured and fastened really inside this rather bulky stock. So we have a thick kind of bull barrel in today's standards and a rather thick stock to accommodate that. The snap lock operates in many respects similarly to a flint lock. Uh, it's kind of a carryover, the hybrid between the wheel lock mechanism and the later flint lock or dog lock mechanisms, depending on where you're at. We have our serpentine arm here, like you'd see on your uh, wheel lock or on your match lock. Very similar designs to those earlier locks. We can pull that head up slightly to release our pan cover. On many of these early style rifles, you have a sliding or a pivoting pan cover here to keep water or other damp conditions out of your priming pan. Forward of that, we have a rather small frizzen and we have a small frizzen cover. But what's interesting about this is we still have the sliding pan cover here. So our frizzen pan cover is just sized enough to cover the cutout in the pan where our priming powder would go. It's a rather deep pan here, but later on we'll see this frizzen pan cover will say expand to cover the entirety of the pan to become its own pan cover and we'll see the loss of our rotating or our sliding pan covers. Just below our frizzen like many later styled lock systems we have our external frizzen spring. On this lock plate we have some beautiful period engraving very stylistic very artistically executed I would say and even on our arm here that would hold some kind of flint uh, you know, to strike the steel frizzen. We see some filing artwork here. Just some simple motifs to give these shapes a little bit of style. Coming up to the top of the barrel, we have our rear sight about four inches forward of the touch hole here. No maker's mark or maker's name on this barrel. We do have the initials on the lock plate and on the cheek piece side though, that may indicate an owner or perhaps the maker of this arm. Coming to our rear sight here, it's an interesting rear sight. It's much larger than some of the other rear sights that we see. From the side, it looks to be very large, but looking at it from the top, you'll notice we have kind of an H-shaped rear sight. The horizontal bar of the H making up our notch rear sight here. On either side, either upright of the H, we have some filed designs in there, some notches and some raised areas, giving it some artistic quality. We have a full octagon barrel. It is slightly swamped and you can tell looking at it a bit from the top here. We have a full length four stock here. It's wood going all the way out to the muzzle where we have a sheet iron nose cap out here. At the front we have a simple brass blade front sight. Very low profile once again like we see on many of these early muzzle loaders. Really tiny out there but when lining up your sight picture it does line right up. Uh, when you bring this rifle up, which I really enjoy about these original arms. They're very comfortable, even in kind of the odd butt stock that we have. When you bring this up, the sights line up very well. You might notice looking at it from the side here, we have an absence of any ramrod thimbles. So back here at the base where we'd have our entry pipe, we just have a simple carved area here and a hole into the stock. Coming forward from our entry hole here, we have a beautiful ramrod channel mortise carved in here. Just very well done, very even all the way across and still very pronounced despite this rifle's age. As we come up to the nose end of the rifle, we have a beautiful wood ramrod pipe, I would say, that is solid to the stock. 
And I believe to protect it, we have a simple sheet iron band going around about center into this wood ramrod pipe. So a very simple way to retain our ramrod here. No external hardware. It's shaped with the stock to be kind of all inclusive. And with that, we don't have any extra pins or pin holes to hold in any ramrod thimbles. We have some simple carving going perpendicular to the ramrod across this section of the stock. And like I said, I believe the sheet iron band here is there to protect this area of the wood. That would be a very weak spot on the stock just hanging out here where it encapsulates the ramrod. Rotating this around so you can see our side plate side, you'll see we have a very plain matching four stock here until we get back here to our side plate. Our side plate is a really beautiful lion shaped side plate. There isn't any engraving here, but the silhouette of this side plate really matches well with other illustrations, other side plates from the era, other pieces of art from the era of lions in this kind of striking pose with a paw coming out. Our side plate is accompanied by two large lock bolts, one at the front and one at the center up high here. The more forward facing lock bolt is at the end of the curved lion's tail and the center lock bolt holding in the upper part of the lock here is back at kind of your shoulder blade of the lion. Coming to the rear cheek area of the rifle, we have a matching swoop kind of covering through the top three quarters of our cheek piece and we have our MRK relief carved into this. I want to mention as well, we have a very thin sheet iron butt plate held on with a series of tacks or nails back here at the end. Very flat, not comfortable when you bring this up to your shoulder, which makes me think that this is not a weapon necessarily to be shouldered. Overall, a neat piece, I think, when we think about and we look at other Baltic area muzzleloaders, especially in the late 17th century, like we have here, we're gonna see a lot of similarities. We're gonna see a lot of similarities in this rifle and other rifles from the Baltic area and the areas around it. We kind of have a hybridization, I would say, between some of the European stylings for the time and then some of the stylings that we see in more of the Middle Eastern regions. I hope that you've enjoyed taking a look at this original muzzleloader with me. I know it's not necessarily the most popular style of muzzleloader out there. The American long rifles are definitely a fan favorite, but I do like looking at these muzzleloaders like this one from different parts of the world in different eras really, we can kind of start to see a comprehensive look when we start to look at more global representation of muzzleloaders and the timing of these muzzleloaders. We can see how things changed and we can almost kind of see why things changed as we look and analyze muzzleloaders just like this one. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to share this and many other original muzzleloaders with you. I'd like to thank also the guys in the describing department for the research they put forth on this and each and every firearm and muzzleloader included there that goes through this auction house. I think it's just incredible uh, that they document all this stuff for us and they put it out there for free for us to read and understand and kind of get familiar with, um, you know, the history of firearms, muzzleloaders from all different kinds of eras. So thank you guys for all the hard work you do. I could not do this all without you. If you'd like to learn more about this or any other muzzleloader that we're looking at here, I'd encourage you to visit the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages where they post a great amount of high quality photos and educational content for you to learn from about firearms history. I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.